Amiel's Journal, 6th and 7th April, 1851, by Henri Frédéric Amiel, 1821 to 1881, translated by Mary Augusta Ward, 1851 to 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 6 April 1851 Was there ever anyone so vulnerable as I? If I were a father, how many griefs and vexations a child might cause me? As a husband, I should have a thousand ways of suffering, because my happiness demands a thousand conditions. I have a heart too easily reached, a too restless imagination. Despair is easy to me, and every sensation reverberates again and again within me. What might be spoils for me what is. What ought to be consumes me with sadness, so that reality, the present, the irreparable, the necessary, repel and even terrify me. I have too much imagination, conscience, and penetration, and not enough character. The life of thought alone seems to me to have enough elasticity and immensity to be free enough from the irreparable. Practical life makes me afraid, and yet at the same time it attracts me. I have need of it. Family life, especially in all its delightfulness, in all its moral depth, appeals to me almost like a duty. Sometimes I cannot escape from the ideal of it. A companion of my life, of my work, of my thoughts, of my hopes, within. A common worship towards the world outside, kindness and beneficence, educations to undertake the thousand and one moral relations which develop round the first all these ideas intoxicate me sometimes but i put them aside because every hope is as it were an egg whence a serpent may issue instead of a dove because every joy missed is a stab because every seed confided to destiny contains an ear of grief which the future may develop I am distrustful of myself and of happiness because I know myself. The ideal poisons for me all imperfect possession. Everything which comprises the future or destroys my inner liberty, which enslaves me to things or obliges me to be other than I could and ought to be, all which injures my idea of the perfect man hurts me mortally degrades and wounds me in mind even beforehand i abhor useless regrets and repentances the fatality of the consequences which follow upon every human act the leading idea of dramatic art and the most tragic element of life arrest me more certainly than the arm of the commodore i only act with regret and almost by force to be dependent is to me terrible, but to depend upon what is irreparable, arbitrary, and unforeseen, and above all to be so dependent by my own fault and through my own error to give up liberty and hope, to slay sleep and happiness, this would be hell. All that is necessary, providential, in short, unimputable, I could bear, I think, with some strength of mind, but responsibility mortally envenoms grief, and as an act is essentially voluntary, therefore I act as little as possible. Last outbreak of a rebellious and deceitful self-will, craving for repose, for satisfaction, for independence. Is there not some relic of selfishness in such a disinterestedness? such a fear such idle susceptibility i wish to fulfill my duty but where is it what is it here inclination comes in again and interprets the oracle and the ultimate question is this 
does duty consist in obeying one's nature even the best and most spiritual or in conquering it life is it essentially the education of the mind and intelligence or that of the will and does will show itself in strength or in resignation if the aim of life is to teach us renunciation then welcome sickness hindrances sufferings of every kind but if its aim is to produce the perfect man then one must watch over one's integrity of mind and body to court trial is to tempt god at bottom the god of justice veils from me the god of love i tremble instead of trusting whenever conscience speaks with a divided uncertain and disputed voice it is not yet the voice of god descend still deeper into yourself until you hear nothing but a clear and undivided voice a voice which does away with doubt and brings with it persuasion light and serenity happy says the apostle are they who are at peace with themselves and whose heart condemneth them not in the part they take this inner identity this unity of conviction is all the more difficult the more the mind analyzes discriminates and foresees it is difficult indeed for liberty to return to the frank unity of instinct alas we must then reclimb a thousand times the peaks already scaled and reconquer the points of view already won we must fight the fight the human heart like kings signs mere truces under a pretense of perpetual peace the eternal life is eternally to be rewon alas yes peace itself is a struggle or rather it is struggle and activity which are the law we only find rest in effort as the flame only finds existence in combustion o oh, heraclitus the symbol of happiness is after all the same as that of grief anxiety and hope hell and heaven are equally restless the altar of vesta and the sacrifice of beelzebub burn with the same fire and yes there you have life life double-faced and double-edged the fire which enlightens is also the fire which consumes the element of the gods may become that of the accursed seventh april eighteen fifty one read a part of Ruge's volume die academy 1848 where the humanism of the neo-hegelians in politics religion and literature is represented by correspondence or articles kuno fischer hollock etc they recalled the philosophist party of the last century able to dissolve anything by reason and reasoning but unable to construct anything for construction rests upon feeling instinct and will one finds them mistaking philosophic consciousness for realizing power the redemption of the intelligence for the redemption of the heart that is to say the part for the whole these papers make me understand the radical difference between morals and intellectualism the writers of them wish to supplant religion by philosophy man is the principle of their religion and intellect is the climax of man their religion then is the religion of intellect there you have the two worlds christianity brings and preaches salvation by the conversion of the will humanism by the emancipation of the mind one attacks the heart the other the brain both wish to enable man to reach his ideal but the ideal differs if not by its content at least by the disposition of its content by the predominance and sovereignty given to this or that inner power for one the mind is the organ of the soul for the other 
the soul is an inferior state of the mind the one wishes to enlighten by making better the other to make better by enlightening it is the difference between socrates and jesus the cardinal question is that of sin the question of immanence or of dualism is secondary the trinity the life to come paradise and hell may cease to be dogmas and spiritual realities the form and the letter may vanish away the question of humanity remains what is it which saves how can man be led to be truly man is the ultimate root of his being responsibility yes or no and is doing or knowing the right acting or thinking his ultimate end if science does not produce love it is insufficient now all that science gives is the amor intellectualis of spinoza light without warmth a resignation which is contemplative and grandiose but inhuman because it is scarcely transmissible and remains a privilege one of the rarest of all moral love places the center of the individual in the center of being it has at least salvation in principle the germ of eternal life to love is virtually to know to know is not virtually to love there you have the relation of these two modes of man the redemption wrought by science or by intellectual love is then inferior to the redemption wrought by will or by moral love the first may free a man from himself it may enfranchise him from egotism the second drives the ego out of itself makes it active and fruitful the one is critical purifying negative the other is vivifying fertilizing positive science however spiritual and substantial it may be in itself is still formal relatively to love moral force is then the vital point and this force is only produced by moral force like alone acts upon like therefore do not amend by reasoning but by example approach feeling by feeling do not hope to excite love except by love be what you wish others to become let yourself and not your words preach for you philosophy then to return to the subject can never replace religion revolutionaries are not apostles although the apostles may have been revolutionaries to save from the outside to the inside and by the outside i understand also the intelligence relatively to the will is an error and a danger the negative part of the humanist's work is good it will strip christianity of an outer shell which has become superfluous baruch and fierbach cannot save humanity she must have her saints and her heroes to complete the work of her philosophers science is the power of man and love his strength man becomes man only by the intelligence but he is man only by the heart knowledge love power there is the complete life end of emile's journal sixth and seventh april eighteen fifty one by henri frederick amiel eighteen twenty one to eighteen eighty one translated by mary augusta ward eighteen fifty one to nineteen twenty